Primary election day in Florida is just a month away. It's time to meet the candidates. This original program is provided as a public service by WSRE, the League of Women Voters, and Pensacola State College. Good evening and welcome to Rally 2016. I'm Molly Barrows with WSRE-TV. And I'm Sandra Averhart with WUWF Public Media. This is the final of three nights of Rally 2016, primary election coverage on WSRE-TV, PBS for the Gulf Coast. Rally is also being simulcast on News Radio 1620. Rally allows you the opportunity to meet the candidates from primary races in Escambia, Santa Rosa, and Okaloosa counties, as well as candidates in state and national races races that impact these counties. Let's take a look back. Tuesday we met candidates for the U.S. District 1 congressional seat and candidates from Santa Rosa County. Wednesday we heard from candidates for Florida Senate District 1, Florida House District 4, and local races in Okaloosa County. And tonight we wrap up with candidates in Escambia County races, including County Commission Districts 1 and 5, Tax Collector, School Board District 1, as well as Sheriff. And a reminder that the questions that will be put before the candidates tonight have been provided to us by the League of Women Voters of the Pensacola Bay Area. The candidates have not seen the questions. They will be asked the same questions and they will have 45 seconds to respond. Following the question and answer session, each candidate will have an additional 45 seconds to deliver a closing statement. And it is time to get started with the questions for the candidates. There are three candidates in the Escambia County Commission District 1 race. Our candidates are seated in alphabetical order. The first we will introduce is Mr. Jeff Burgosh. Seated next to him, Mr. Jesse Casey. And next to him, Ms. Karen Sindel. Candidates, welcome. All right, let's start our question and answer session and we will begin alphabetically with you, Mr. Burgosh. And our first question tonight, with the destruction of the jail, Scamby County is housing inmates in other counties and facilities at a cost of $450,000 a month. How can the situation be improved prior to the construction of a new jail? Well, I think first and foremost, you got to look at the most cost effective way to manage that. It's my understanding that there was a there was a offer made by Walton County for a significantly lower cost to uh, to house the inmates as well as transport them. And so I think you got to look at what the most cost uh, efficient way to do that is. And I think if Walton County is willing to do it for a, a lower cost, and uh, then we should have done that. It's also my understanding that that figure is a bit inflated because there are fixed costs with housing the prisoners, whether they're here or over there. And the other issue that hasn't really been discussed as part of that is the fact that uh, with, with prisoners so far away, and not able to see their public defender, it's really becoming a burden on the court system. So there's many issues with that. All right, thank you so much. And just a reminder, when you hear that ding, that's a five second warning that your 45 seconds is almost up. So I think our next question goes to you. It's the same question, I'm sorry, Mr. Casey. It's uh, with the destruction of the jail, spending 450,000 a month to house inmates and other facilities, how can the situation be improved prior to the construction of the new jail? Well, it it could have been improved tremendously by um, by we we already know what the um, what the footprint of the jail was going to be, and we should already have a workable set of prints. Uh, we could have, we could accomplish that within nine months, and um, and then uh, when once we located the land, we should have um, you know we could move forward there. So um, you know time is money, and we should already have that accomplished. All right, thank you, Mr. Casey. Ms. Sindel, how can the situation be improved prior to building a new jail? A couple of different things. First of all, we need to look at how do we lock in the price. The price has fluctuated since we first started doing this. So we need to review our current process and determine why is the price moving and how do we lock it in. The other thing we need to look in is what other opportunity is there to save money? If, if we are part of that price, is it fixed just with the inmates being there? Does it include travel and transport time? Can some of this be handled through video interview or our camera opportunity? Part of not having a plan puts us in this kind of crisis management. And we didn't have a plan. We moved into crisis management. We did what we had to do. But this is gonna take a while, so we need to step back and we need to reevaluate. 
All right, thank you. All right, our next question, our next question will go to Mr. Casey first. Summer traffic to Pensacola Beach has become a major problem. What recommendations can you offer to mitigate this issue? I think, um, I think that came up before the county commissioners before. The Santa Rosa Island Authority, I believe they, uh, they've addressed that. Also parking garages and everything. And um, I think, um, I think the, uh, the committee, they, they need to stay focused and they could uh, bring solutions there. All right, thank you. Ms. Sindel, your opportunity now. What recommendations can you offer to mitigate this problem of summer traffic on Pensacola Beach? Well, as a current appointee to the Santa Rosa Island Authority, this is a big topic of conversation for us. And as you're well aware, we've moved into the Sun Pass system. Uh, once we have that fully operational, that's going to make a big difference because you won't be stopping any longer. It will be straight traffic onto the beach. We're also having conversations about perhaps a parking garage, but not on the beach. What if we build one as a collaborative effort with Gulf Breeze? So a way for people to park in Gulf Breeze and be transported to the beach through perhaps our trolley system. The other conversation is the ferry. The ferries are going to help to some degree with traffic, but they're not going to be as big of a saving grace as we would have liked, but they are going to help. All right, thank you. And now, Mr. Bragash, your opportunity to address well, this issue of summer traffic on the well, beach. Well, first and foremost, it's a good problem to have, right? I mean, we want people to come to the beach, and it is, it is a real point of consternation when you're trying to leave the beach in the afternoon and you're stuck in an hour, hour and a half of traffic. I think a lot of it could be handled if we um, really looked, took a step back and looked at the traffic pattern, the traffic flow on Pensacola Beach. I even heard that a while back they talked about putting roundabouts out there, which would have been a disaster. Um, I certainly would never support, I've heard people throw out the idea of raising the toll. I certain, certainly would never support that. But I think it's just an issue that, you know, on, on peak, peak times, it's like a restaurant. At dinner hour, it's gonna be busy and, and you manage it the best way you can. The ferry will help ease it. Technology is a way to do it with the Sun Pass. And, um, and you just be happy that you have that group of people there I spending you. money at the beach. Thank you. All right, question number three now, and we begin with you, Ms. Sindel. The Environmental Protection Agency has verified that the former Superfund site on Pensacola Boulevard, Highway 29, meets environmental standards and can be developed. What plan can you offer for use of this large acreage? We're going to have to have a big, big conversation about that. Um, being able to develop on a Superfund site is not something that you jump in quickly. We know that from a residential component, there would be heavy concerns. We have to look at what would need to be mitigated in order for that to occur and who's going to pick up that cost. It's great to step back and say, we now have this large piece of land and perhaps we could do some type of commercial component to it, but again, it's looking at what is it gonna to take to mitigate a Superfund site. Perhaps it meets EPA standards, but what are the standards that our citizens expect us to have? What requirements will need to be met so that we understand that what will be built there will be safe for everyone? All right, thank you, Ms. Sindel. Mr. Bagash? Well, it was my understanding that after the Superfund analyzed the site that it was ready to go. I know it was one of the sites that was considered for the jail. And frankly, I thought that would have been the more logical site for that facility. Um, going forward, you have to look at what, what the market wants. What, what does the market need and what would that, what would that sort of land suit? And um, I think there's a number of things you could do. Uh, I think there are park uh, plan. You could do a park, you could do a recreation thing, you could do a parking facility, you could do some automotive type. Uh, there's a lot of different commercial construction that you could do there. Uh, but I do believe the hazards have been mitigated and that's why they've released it. That's my understanding of it. All right, thank you, Mr. Bagash. Mr. Casey? The perception is already there. And uh, that would be one, one large obstacle you'd have to overcome. And I, I, think, uh, I think what I would do, uh, one person such as myself wouldn't have all the answers. So I would reach out to the community and all the players involved, uh, whether it be a park or, uh, or a structure and uh, get their input and um, whatever the majority ruled that uh, they want to put there, then I believe we'd move forward there. All right, thank you, Mr. Casey. All right, we're up to question number four, and Mr. Burgosh, you'll get that one first. The Pensacola Bay Center is subsidized by the tourist development tax in the amount of $1.3 million a year. What action, if any, should the county take to address this financial loss? Well, I think a number of years back, the proposal was floated to, to actually go ahead and recapitalize it, make it bigger, make it a convention center. That way we can get more events like Pensacon. 
Um, I, I think I've heard different people say it should be closed unless it's self-sufficient. I've heard different voices say that, but the minute you do that, we're going to lose all the good concerts, all the good events to the wharf over in Orange Beach and then over in Destin and other places. So I think you have to be bold. You have to look at recapitalizing it, making a world-class convention center capable of handling more of the Pensacon type events that not only bring people for the event, but bring people that are staying overnight, heads in the beds. So we got to be creative. Money is relatively inexpensive now. You can bond it. There are different things that you could do, but um, the status quo has to end. And I think uh, recapitalization is the way to go. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Casey, what is your recommendation for dealing with the financial loss at the Pensacola Bay Center? Well, you, you got, um, I, see, I see several opportunities. Just, um, you could um, maybe reach out to UWF and uh, see, if, uh, see if they would take it over, then, the, um, then uh, you would get state funding. Uh, number one, number one, there's um, the school's uh, graduation. Uh, you need a place for, for the kids to graduate, and they've been utilizing the facility there for quite some time. But possibility we could go back to the high schools where you, where you participated in the graduation there. But we need to, we need to have a plan where the activities that are, be, that are going on there, we can move them to other locations. And then, um, then I think we need to move forward. Um, with the, um, the building's outdated. Thank you. Ms. Swindell. Sindel. Sindel, I'm sorry. <laughs> what do we need it for? And is it serving its purpose? And it's, is it serving the purpose that we're paying for? There's a lot of commentary that we need to keep the Bay Center in order to have a location for graduations? Is it worth 1.3 million in subsidy to make sure that we have a place for graduations? There's conversation about converting it to a convention center, a true convention center. Well, when we speak with uh, hoteliers and people in that industry that will tell you for it to be a true convention center, there's gotta be a lot of changes. There's gotta be a lot more amenities that are added to it. So as a community, when we look at our elected officials and we talk about holding them accountable for how all of our dollars are spent, we have to ask ourselves, do we need it and what do we need it to do? Thank you, Ms. Sindel. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and we begin our next question with you, Mr. Casey. What is your top priority for improving the county's infrastructure in areas such as roads, bridges, and drainage? Infrastructure, I've been in construction 40 plus years creating jobs, building businesses. Not only my own, but businesses for other people. Um, jobs would be important. Infrastructure, um, uh, roads, roads access. Um, we, need to, we need to move forward. Uh, sidewalks, so our kids will be safe going, going to school. Involving the communities, uh, whether it's Beulah or down south, uh, south of our district, for the Bay Country Club. We need to figure out a way to put red lights at, infra, at, um, at dangerous intersections. Um, so, uh, thank you. And that's your warning bell. You have five seconds, by the way, if you want okay. to continue. <laughs> All right, so I will take that question to you now, Ms. Sindel. What is your top priority for improving the county's infrastructure, like roads, bridges, and drainage? Infrastructure is critical and ours is failing. We're a large community with old roads and very old infrastructure. What's worse is we don't have a strategic plan in place, which means we also don't have the funding completely lined up to understand not just how to take care of the problems we have now, but we're a community continuing to grow. So how do you prioritize those funds? Do you correct the problems you have now? And how do you plan for future growth, such as in District 1 around Navy Federal with the potential for not just 10,000 jobs at Navy Federal, but 4,000 at a potential Commerce Park next door? We need a grant writer that's affiliated with this county. We need to look at how to chase state and federal funds that will help with the infrastructure projects. But most importantly, we need a strategic plan. All right, thank you, Ms. Sindel. Mr. Bergash? Um, drainage is the number one issue in my district. I've been to 8,300 homes personally door to door from Ilanthus and Bower, where there's an entire residential community that floods routinely to Dunaway Road, which is a f flooded out area to Rebel Road and Beulah. Drainage is the number one issue. So my proposal is form a committee. Let's triage it. Let's get these issues that have been lingering for years and years. Let's get them to the table. Let's find a settle. Let's find a way to settle them. Um, another issue is unsafe roadways. A lot of parents are concerned 
the roads are too thin with not with insufficient shoulders. Um, there's there's roadways that have had multiple wrecks. Mobile Highway at Beulah. I've talked to concerned residents there. We're in the process of getting that fixed. Um, Merlin Road coming out to Sorrento, another big problem. So we got to look at them, we got to triage them, and we got to get them fixed. All right, thank you, Mr. Bagash. All right, uh, Ms. Sindel, you'll get this question first. Please comment on whether the Santa Rosa Island Authority should remain as currently structured or become a department directly under control of Escambia County? Well, this is a great question for me because I certainly, I currently sit as an appointee to this board. We are in the process of doing a restructure and less than my first year there, we reduced the lease fees out on Santa Rosa Island, which is Pensacola Beach, which for most people don't know this, is our community's largest park. We did that by consolidating a lot of service, such as public works and public safety, with the county. We went from over 90 employees to nine. We reduced the budget in half, 50%. So moving it forward, it's important to understand that the Island Authority serves a purpose, but it also is part of this community. And it's important as moving forward that that consolidation of service continue. All right, thank you. Mr. Burgosh, your opportunity for this question, your comments on whether the Island Authority should remain as it's currently structured or become a department of the county. Well, anytime you can do functional consolidation and, and provide the same level of service to the taxpayers and the citizens while saving money, I think it's something that you look at. However, I would caution the folks that I've spoken with that own property out of the beach, you know, their concern is, are they going to get the same level of service? A lot of revenue comes in out at the beach, so we have to make sure that the service regardless of who's providing it, whether it's the Island Authority or the county staff, we got to make sure the level of service is, is, is at a level that it's not going to impact our tourist base. So I would say, and the people that live out there year round. So if we can do it under the county and it makes sense and it saves money, I'm all for it. But we got to make sure we keep that beach in tip top shape because it's a big, it brings in a lot of money for the county. All right, thank you. Mr. Casey. That being said, I've been to, um, in the last six years, I've been to over 500 uh, county meetings. And to my understanding, this past year, the county has already moved forward to, um, to uh, making that happen. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, and this will be our last question, and we'll start with you, Mr. Bagash. What is your top priority for use of the BP settlement funds the county expects to receive? Well, without question, um, after you get through all the environmental projects um, and you get down to economic development, the number one project on the list is the OLF Site 8 Economic Development Project for a Commerce Park. I think we've got to look right away as soon as possible at getting the master plan done. The, the item has been budgeted, line itemed in the, uh, in the application, 635000 We get that done, and then we find a way to tie it to a master plan for all of uh, that area of town where, um, where you have areas of uh, uh, intersection, contingent intersections in the plan. And uh, you get that done, and then we find a way to get that project moving. That project will bring high paying jobs. It'll be done right. The residents around there will, will benefit from some services that will uh, benefit the community, like a walking trail and a bike path. So I think that's number one. All right, thank you, Mr. Bagash. Mr. Casey, what is your top priority for use of the BP settlement funds the county expects to receive? Well, they've, they've had a uh, committee to look at that, and they've ranked, uh, ranked the various projects that are in line, so that's pretty much already in, in place there. But you know what, um, number, one, number one would be the safety of the people and the residents that live in Escambia County. Um, and, um, but I'm all about jobs. But um, you know, there's a, there's a lot, of, lot of safety issues where there's roads, uh, red lights, but, um, and, and jobs, jobs are important. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Casey. And Ms. Sindel? Since January, when I announced I was running for office, I started the conversation very openly and very publicly that we need a master plan for Navy Outlying Landing Field 8, which is the 640 acres next to Navy Federal. This is our, as a community, our big opportunity for job growth, for economic development, but there's no plan. There's no plan on how to handle the potential traffic, the amenities that are necessary for that end of the community. My suggestion was picked up by both the Chamber of Commerce and Florida West who wrote a letter of support to the Board of County Commissioners strongly suggesting that one of the top priorities with BP money for economic development needs to be to fund Karen's suggestion of a master plan for OLF8. All right, thank you, Ms. Sindel. All right, and that concludes the questions for the candidates for Escambia County Commission District 1. Now each candidate has 45 seconds to deliver a closing statement and moving along the line, 
The closing statements, I believe, will begin with Mr. Casey. You know, if you're, if you're looking for somebody smooth talking and politically cor correct, you're number one looking at the wrong candidate. I am who I am. I'm a simple person, worked all my life in the construction industry. And um, you know, when the baby kissing's over with, you need somebody that's gonna be there. And I've been on the same cul-de-sac for 59 years. I have no place to go, this is home. So I plan to, what I wanna do is make Escambia County a better place to live and work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Casey. Ms. Sindel? I'm a business leader. I'm a small business owner. I'm a Navy wife. I'm the person who has spent under 10 different county commissioners almost 20 years fighting for this community. I've helped craft policy, write the comp plan, the land development code, and create protections such as keeping cell phone towers out of your front yard and moving us forward in a positive way toward economic development. I'm the candidate who has worked behind the scenes very hard for this community. I'm the candidate that will continue to do so. I'm Karen Sindel, and I'm running for County Commissioner, District 1. Thank you. Mr. Bagosh? I'm Jeff Bagosh. I've served you, District 1, for 10 years. I'm talking to you, District 1. I've enjoyed every minute of it. I've been asked. I was encouraged to run for this position. And since I started running back in July of last year, I've been to 8,300 homes personally, door to door. I've met a lot of you. I've taken your concerns. I've analyzed them and your concerns I've developed and put them into a plan of action that I will put into effect if I'm so fortunate to be elected. You can look at that plan right now at jeffbergosh.com and you can read about it. Um, I'm a guy that has a track record. You know, the best predictor of future performance is look at the past. I have a 10 year record on the school board. I won't raise your property taxes because the governments must live within their means. And I'll do what I say I'm gonna do. I'll hold people accountable. And I would just encourage you on election day, vote Jeff Bergosh, I won't let you down. And thank you, Mr. Bergosh, and thank you all candidates for being with us tonight. And as we wrap up the first question and answer session, we want to remind you that you are watching Rally 2016 here on WSRE TV, where candidates in the upcoming primary have the opportunity to answer questions about some of the issues. And a reminder that these questions for tonight's races were prepared by the League of Women Voters, Pensacola Bay Area. Up next, we move on to the race for Escambia County Sheriff. We'll be back in just a moment. There is nothing more important to our democratic process than having an informed electorate voting on election day. Good evening, I am Ed Meadows, president of Pensacola State College, thanking you for tuning into this rally, a joint presentation of the League of Women Voters, WSRE-TV and Pensacola State College. Rally allows you the opportunity to watch and listen as this election year's slate of candidates answer the tough questions concerning the needs of our community. WSRE, a service of Pensacola State College, is proud to bring this program to you as a public service. And as always, we invite your comments and suggestions about how we can further fulfill our community obligations. Let's all remember the importance of participating in the governance process by voting in the upcoming election. Thanks for watching this year's rally event on WSRE TV. I am Haley Richards. Ellen Rostin and I serve as co-presidents of the League of Women Voters of the Pensacola Bay Area. For nearly 30 years, the leagues here and in Okaloosa County have provided questions for events like tonight's forum as a service to our local communities. Our democracy is based on active participation by informed citizens, and voting is an important way to participate. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization, which means we don't support or oppose parties or candidates. We work to increase understanding of major public policy issues and encourage informed and active participation in government. This rally is one way for us to make accurate and nonpartisan information available to voters. You can also contact us for explanations of amendments and other ballot issues. We invite women and men to attend our public events or join us as members of the League. For more information, visit lwvpba.org or lwvokaloosa.org. And please remember to be an informed voter this year.
Welcome back to Rally 2016. We move on now to the race for sheriff in Escambia County. There are four candidates and they are all Republican. Let's now meet them. They are in alphabetical order and the first candidate tonight is Mr. Doug Baldwin Sr. Seated next to him is Mr. John Johnson. Next, Mr. Ron McNesby. And next to him is the incumbent, Mr. David Morgan. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. All right, we will go ahead and get started with our questions. And Mr. Baldwin, you will get the first question first. If you are elected to this office, please give us your top priority and how would you address it? My first and most important priority is the addressing the crime problem here. And the way we would do that, we would do a complete realignment of the sheriff's office, um, putting more officers on the streets at the bottom end, alleviate, alleviating some of the positions up top that's consuming a large amount of uh, taxpayers' money. And we will make sure that we have enough officers on the bottom end and on the street to cover some of the areas that's plagued with crime in our community. All right, thank you. Mr. Johnson, your top priorities. Thank you. Actually, my top priority is a, a three-step process. Uh, the first part involves uh, actively reducing the availability of heroin in Escambia County. We have people that are dying in Escambia County from heroin drug overdoses. Uh, the second part uh, is that we have to reach out to the community. We have to improve our relationship with the community and specifically because that enhances the enforcement operations that we're able to conduct. And then the third part uh, of that process uh, is in preparing the men and women that work for the Escambia County Sheriff's Office. Uh, the office is not very healthy and we've got to make some changes to help them do their job better. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. McNesby. Thank you very much. In my opinion, the biggest problem facing Escambia County today is the drug problem. I travel around and talk to a lot of people. That seems to be the one thing that's on their mind. The second thing that I think we need to work on is retention of law enforcement officers. Uh, the current administration has told in the request for his budget before the county commissioners that he's having a hard time. He's losing 50 deputies a year. I think we got to work harder to keep those deputies and give them a reason to stay in Escambia County. Money, benefits, and relationships. I think that's really important. Part of that is through the officer training program. We need more training, better training than we have today. Uh, I've talked to many officers and that's the one thing they feel like they're being left out on is training. All right, thank you. And Mr. Morgan, if you're reelected to this office, give us your top priority and how you would address it. Well, we have an organization that's pointed in the right direction and that's, uh, you know, I think verifiable by the number of neighborhood watches we have. When I took office, we had 13, we now have 150. We've actually reduced our administration from 55% down to 27%. We train twice to the requirement of the state standard with our officers. We're currently going through a glut of loss of officers and that's due to the drop program, meaning that because of the cycle of retirements at the Escambia County Sheriff's Office, you will occasionally have a large number of officers that are retiring. Right now we have 433 sworn positions. I have 417 that are filled, so we have no issue with manpower. I would tell you that community outreach will continue to be the goal here. We've not had the problems in Escambia County that they've had in other areas of the United States, primarily because of that. We have a tremendous, tremendous community outreach. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. And our next question will go first to you, Mr. Johnson. And it is on the issue of training and retaining personnel. What are your plans for recruiting, training, and retaining qualified personnel at the Sheriff's Office? I'm glad that you asked that question. Uh, the incumbent has chosen to spend over a million dollars in law enforcement trust funds. Uh, those funds could be used for training. Uh, the alternative, if those funds are spent in another way, means that training dollars have to come from salary dollars. Uh, training dollars have to come from the county commission in the annual budget. So uh, we wind up paying for that training twice. The funds that were paid out to some other purpose and then we replace it and spend it again for training. We also have to develop a retention plan uh, we have men and women that have special knowledge and skills to do the jobs that they do, and we need to have a program that keeps them here. All right, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mr. McNesby, your opportunity to say more about what you would do to 
uh, improve recruiting, training, and retaining qualified personnel. Well, I think it's a fact around the country it's hard to attract law enforcement officers today, and it's getting harder every day simply because of what we see going on around the country. Officers are in a lot of danger today, and it's hard to find people that are willing to take the job for the money that it pays. Uh, the officer's starting salary today, according to the Sheriff's Office website, is exactly the same as it was eight years ago. We've got to do better for pay, we've got to do better for benefits, but we definitely got to do more for training. We got to have a better training facility. Uh, our officers shoot firearms down below the garbage dump. Uh, not a very good operation. It should, it should be improved on. It should be more training within the agency and bringing people from the outside to do the training. Thank you, and Mr. Morgan. Well, that's an inaccurate statement. Uh, our salary is up to 35, 36,000. We currently had approved by the Board of County Commission a salary study that will be conducted at the end of this year to make our salaries commensurate with the rest of the state of Florida for counties that are the like size. Again, we've trained to twice the state required average on the range and also in our classroom training. We've upgraded to computer models, which again, we have officers in simulated situations, shoot, don't shoot scenarios, which are verbally controlled. Uh, we are state of the art when it comes to training. And again, I would remind everyone with the problems that we're seeing in the rest of the United States, you don't have them in a scan County. That's because of the leadership there in Escambia County. As far as trust funds and let funds go, monies can only be spent for certain items and I would tell you that our budget is fine as well as our training dollars. All right, thank you Mr. Morgan. Mr. Baldwin, now your plans for recruiting, training and retaining qualified personnel. Yes, um, we have to create a robust, excuse me, a robust training program to attract uh, people across the board, uh, minorities uh, who uh, represent uh, the department in such a way where it helps attract other minorities into the line of uh, the field of law enforcement. We also have to, just like someone mentioned earlier, we have to raise the salary of officers. Um, in order for us to do the things that has been mentioned, we have to be able to retain officers and pay them a decent salary. If we don't do that, we're spinning our wheels. Um, training is very important as well, and those training dollars can, can come from various sources. We can get grants, uh, we can use the LETF funds, but we have to be able to retain these officers. All right, thank you. We're now up to question number four, a uh, correction cor uh, number three, and it'll go first to you, Mr. McNesby. What strategies would you use to resolve Sheriff's Office budget issues with the Escambia County Commission? Well, that's a, that's a moving target sometimes, but um, the way we used to do it is our chief financial officer worked with the chief financial officer for the county commission, and they worked out most all of the problems prior to the actual budget hearing before the commissioners. It's an ongoing relationship. It's something that you have to do weekly, monthly. You have to stay in co contact with your county commissioners. They are the funding source for you and they do have input into what they, what they want you to have and how they want you to spend it. But however, the sheriff is a constitutional officer and he sets the own, his own ground rules for that. I don't believe we ever had any serious problem over bus, uh, budget issues with the county commission. I would continue to do that. All right, thank you, Mr. McNesby. Mr. Morgan, uh, what strategies would you use to resolve budget issues with the county? We're very fortunate. We have a tremendous relationship with uh, Mr. Jack Brown and, uh, and the majority of the Board of County Commissioners. Uh, you know, the budget is resolved in workshops, uh, you know, with the County Commission prior to coming up for the required three public hearings before the vote on the final budget. Uh, and those issues are worked out prior to us getting in there. Um, again, this year we managed to negotiate uh, $300,000 to uh, start transitioning to body cameras uh, at the Escambia County Sheriff's Office. We finally got all the issues with public records and review of the, all of those tapes uh, worked through with the uh, State Attorney's Office. So we'll be transitioning our probationary officers to using body cameras. So again, we've got a tremendous relationship with the County Commission and primarily due uh, to the leadership of Mr. Jack Brown. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. Mr. Baldwin. Um, like I said earlier, we have to look at the waste of the Sheriff's Office that we, we now see. Uh, there is uh, positions at the Sheriff's Office that um, are too heavy at the top. Uh, we have to trim that top heavy area and we have to divert that money to getting more officers on the bottom end on the streets. This is a problem um, with, with crime. 
and we can talk numbers and what we're doing, but we can't do any of these things unless we have more officers on the street responding at a timely manner to, to citizens' complaints and to cover this county like it should be covered by law enforcement. All right, thank you, Mr. Baldwin. We have a request for a rebuttal from Mr. Morgan's 30 seconds. Well, I would remind Mr. Baldwin, my opponents, again, we're from 55% in admin down to 27. Uh, all right, we have 1.6, almost 1.7 officers per thousand. The state requirement is 1.8, recommended by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, and we're almost there. This top-heavy uh, rumor that you may be hearing is pure fantasy. All right, thank you. And finally, Mr. Johnson, you get your opportunity. What strategies would you use to resolve Sheriff's Office budget issues with the Escambia County Commission? I, I honestly don't anticipate any problems uh, when it comes to the budget, and, and this is the reason why. Uh, I believe when it's time to uh, advocate for the agency with the Board of County Commissioners in good faith, that we sit down at the table, uh, they know the needs of the county, they know the needs of the agency, uh, and I believe that we can put that information forward in an honest and respectful way. I also believe that uh, as the sheriff you have the opp opportunity to control uh, things like the let fund. Uh, those monies uh, can be spent in a number of ways that support the function of the sheriff's office. Uh, and we can use those monies without having to ask for additional budget dollars. Uh, so I don't anticipate that. I would work very closely with the commission. All right, thank you. Now up to our next question. Mr. Morgan, you'll get this one first. Please comment on the drug trafficking and addiction problems in Escambia County and explain how you would address them. Well, of course, we address this on a daily basis as the sheriff of Escambia County. Again, we have a very professional narcotics organization that does that. What we home grow here is a little bit of what's called refer or referred to as ditch, ditch weed or ditch mar marijuana some methamphetamine production in the north end of the county, but our primary problem in Escambia County is an influx of heroin, opiates across the board from outside our community, not within our community. We don't produce those drugs in Escambia County. We've also gone from two methadone clinics to four in Escambia County. That unfortunately has drawn some folks into our community, and those who follow drug addiction and drug rehabilitation will tell you that it's five to six times before someone finally beats a drug habit, meaning that you decide you need help you'll fall off the wagon that many times. That increases, unfortunately, our drug addiction in Escambia County. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. We had a request for a rebuttal, but you'll get your opportunity to respond first, okay? And then we'll do a uh, rebuttal. All right, so we'll go next to Mr. Baldwin. Your comments on the drug trafficking and addiction problems in the county and how you would address them. Look, we rank out of 20 cities in this country, we rank number six with the most addicted citizens in Escambia County. Um, that tells me that there's a lot of drug activity out on the streets here of the city of Pensacola and Escambia County. My plan is to create a robust partnership between state, federal, and local agencies, have a strategic plan in place to go after street level narcotics, uh, partnership with those partners to address rehabilitation and partnership with the court system to make sure that these drug dealers that we are arresting, especially on the high end, are stay in jail once we arrest them. All right, thank you. Now, Mr. Johnson, this question to you on the problem of drug trafficking and addiction in Escambia County and how you would address them. I was a special agent with the Drug Enforcement Administration for 22 years. Uh, that's what I've done for a living. We have a horrible drug problem in Escambia County, and because we have a drug problem, we have a crime problem. Uh, that is the sole largest uh, contributor to the crime rate that we have in Escambia County. Uh, we not only have heroin, uh, we have cocaine, crack cocaine, and meth labs uh, at uh, all-time historical high levels uh, in Escambia County right now. Uh, by reducing the availability of those illegal drugs, we would be able to drive, truly drive down the crime rate in Escambia County. People are dying in Escambia County from drug overdoses, and we can address that problem. All right, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Rebuttal from Mr. Morgan. 
Well, obviously my opponents don't read the paper. Our index crimes are down 16 percent in Escambia County and violent crime for the half, first half of this year is down almost 16 percent. Since 2009, it dropped 21 and a half percent. So you add the mid-year with that, our violent crime rates down almost 37 percent in Escambia County. I ask that everyone verify those numbers through the Florida Department of Law Enforcement and the Uniform Crime Report with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. Mr. Johnson? Uh, two things. One, it's easy to adjust the crime rate down whenever you don't count the crime rate for the city of Pensacola. Uh, secondarily, um, in 2012, Escambia County had the highest crime rate in the entire state of Florida. In 2013, the number one highest crime rate. In 2014, we fell to number two in the state only because Leon County developed a worse heroin problem than we have. Last year, we're number two in the state of Florida for the highest per capita crime rate. We have to address the drug, drug problem. Thank you. Mr. Baldwin, rebuttal, 30 seconds. Yes, and that was my same sentiment um, with what Mr. Johnson just said, that, you know, the people here in Escambia County don't feel like they're safe. The numbers doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is people are afraid. There's a lot of drug activity on our streets, and there are little uh, strategic plans in place to address that problem. Now, when we become sheriff, we will address that problem. We strategically know what to do. We've been there and done that. All right, thank you. And now finally, Mr. Magnesby, you get this question. Please comment on the drug trafficking and addiction problems in the county and how you would address them. Well, thank you for the question. I think you'll, you'll see that the three of us pretty much agree with the same thing. I don't believe that crime is down. I don't have any idea that it is. I talk to people every day. The real measuring stick for that is how people feel. They do not feel safe. They know drugs is here. We see it. You see it in your neighbor. Excuse me. <clears throat> you see it in your neighborhoods. Uh, we got to let people feel secure. And the only way you're going to feel secure is to eliminate a crime-rich environment that these drug dealers are operating in. They're on every street corner. They're way right out in the open. It's no secret anymore. That has to be fixed. If not more lives will be lost. Thank you, Mr. McNesby. And we're going to take a short break right now. We'll resume the question and answer session for these candidates in the Escambia County Sheriff's race when we return. There is one amendment to the Florida Constitution on the August primary ballot. A 60% margin is required for passage. Here's a brief look at what that amendment covers. Amendment 4, solar devices or renewable energy source devices, exemption from certain taxation and assessment. The ballot summary reads as follows. Proposing an amendment to the state constitution to authorize the legislature by general law to exempt from ad valorem taxation the assessed value of solar or renewable energy source devices subject to tangible personal property tax and authorize the legislature by general law to prohibit consideration of such devices in assessing the value of real property for ad valorem taxation purposes. This amendment takes effect January 1, 2018 and expires on December 31st, 2037. For more detailed, nonpartisan information, you can access the Florida League Voters Guide. Log on to thefloridavoter.org, the website for the League of Women Voters of Florida. Follow the steps shown on screen in order to obtain the Guide to Florida Amendments. This guide will display a synopsis of the amendment and an explanation of what a yes or no vote will mean. There are three ways to cast a ballot in Escambia County, by mail, early voting, or at your precinct on election day. To vote by mail, contact the Escambia County Supervisor of Elections Office. You can write, phone, fax, email, log on to their website, or ask in person at the Supervisor's Office on Palafox Place in downtown Pensacola. Ballots must reach the Supervisor of Elections Office by 7 p.m. on Election Day. Early voting takes place from Saturday, August 20th through Saturday, August 27th at the seven locations listed on your screen. Early voting times are 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. at the Supervisor of Elections Office and from 9 a.m. until 6 p.m. at all other locations. 
On the day of the primary election, Tuesday, August 30th, voting takes place at your polling location from 7 a.m. until 7 p.m. You must vote in the precinct in which you live and are registered. To verify your precinct, log on to escambiavotes.com. Be sure to bring photo and signature ID with you. Welcome back. We've been hearing from the candidates for Scambia County Sheriff this evening, asking questions prepared by the League of Women, Vote, League of Women Voters, Pensacola Bay Area. Now, continuing down the line, we will begin again with Mr. Baldwin. I think question five to you first. The county commission now has the responsibility for operation of the Escambia County Jail. Should the operations be returned to the sheriff's department? Why or why not? Absolutely. I think it should be returned to the Sheriff's Department. I think that the Sheriff uh, should take over the housing of our citizens. Um, that is in the realm of the responsibilities of a Sheriff, although he don't have to, but um, I think that whenever we house our citizens, uh, it should be uh, from someone that is in public office uh, and not outsourced to someone else to house our citizens. Um, I think that it's very important that people are accountable for the things that we do in our county jail and it's accountable in a clear line of expectations and, and the ability to contact someone when something's wrong. Thank you, Mr. Baldwin. Mr. Johnson, should the operations of the county jail be returned to the Sheriff's Department? Why or why not? Thank you. Absolutely, uh, it should be returned to the Sheriff, uh, to a Sheriff that has law enforcement experience and has worked in the criminal justice system and knows how to get along with the different parts of the criminal justice system. It's very uh, large and very complicated. Uh, the men and women that work at the Escambia County Jail uh, have knowledge and skills that nobody else in Escambia County has. Uh, and they are a paramilitary organization, just like the Sheriff's Office. The mission that they have is closely aligned to that of the Sheriff's Office, the court system. And if the Sheriff of Escambia County is going to be involved uh, in reentry programs and probationary programs, then it's going to be crucial that that facility be available to the Sheriff to participate in those programs. Thank you. And Mr. McNesby. There's no question in my mind that the jail should be operated by the Sheriff of this county. It has been, I've, over my 43 years, I've seen it work both ways with the commissioners and with the sheriff. It always seems to come back to the sheriff because it's a very hard task for commissioners to do. The sheriff has an ultimate responsibility for training. It is very important that the sheriff know about law enforcement, know something about it, be certified. I served as a commissioner over the accreditation process for the whole state of Florida for jails. I've seen some terrible things happen when it does not fall under the sheriff. It does not need to be privatized. It needs to be operated by the sheriff of the county. It should not be abandoned by the sheriff of the county. Thank you, Mr. McNesby. Mr. Morgan. Well, four times in the history of Escambia County, the jail has gone from the sheriff back to the county commission. It's always been about a budget issue, and that's why it was transferred back to the county. After the grand jury of the, in the explosion at CBD, the first grand jury recommendation was that the jail be given back to the sheriff. I've not been approached by the county commission to take the jail back. Uh, the county commission said they could operate it more efficiently uh, and better, and so I think they're going to take a hard run at that. Is it a law enforcement function? Well, of course it is. Uh, it comes under the you know, criminal justice training standards, uh, Florida Department of Law Enforcement, uh, all of those things roping into the criminal justice system. It can be operated very efficiently under the sheriff. Right now, the county commission has determined that they want to do it. So we'll do everything we can to help them with that operation, but at this time, there's no move afoot to return it to the Sheriff of Escambia County. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. Our next question will go to Mr. Johnson first. Do, did you have a rebuttal? No? Okay, we're ready. Do you support the use of body cameras for all deputies, and if so, how can this be funded? I do support the use of body cameras to be worn by the men and women of the Escambia County Sheriff's Office. Uh, I'm sorry to say that in the last 10 or 15 years that law enforcement has grown to the point that we need to record what happens on the street. Uh, there was a time that uh, an officer's testimony in court uh, was never challenged because they knew that they would be honest and truthful. Uh, and unfortunately, maybe we've earned this. Uh, so yes, we do need body cameras. Uh, how can they be funded? Uh, 
I did a little research about two weeks ago and I found that the law enforcement trust fund could have paid for those cameras. Uh, our law enforcement trust fund was spent on other things. Uh, so now uh, Mr. Morgan is asking for $200,000 in budget dollars to buy. Thank you. Mr. McNesby. I agree with uh, Mr. Johnson there. The, the whole problem is things are different in the country today. We need for the jurors to know, we need for the courts to know what an officer is faced with out there. I am 100% in favor of body cameras, but I'm also 100% in favor of funding them out of the Law Enforcement Trust Fund instead of spending $160,000 on a billboard to tell grown people to lock their cars. That money could have bought body cameras. It's, it's not fair to the Law Enforcement Trust Fund to fund a re-election campaign for the sheriff. All right, thank you. Mr. Morgan, this is your opportunity to answer the question. Uh, do you support the use of body cameras for all deputies? And if so, how can it be funded? Well, of course we do. Uh, we uh, are going to do that again. We're probationary employees. And, uh, you know, we think, unfortunately, uh, you know, it's more symbolic gesture than anything else. Why? Because when you look at the, st uh, the statistic, which obviously my opponents are statistically averse, uh, it tells you that less than 2% of all law enforcement contacts with citizens in the United States involve anything above placing handcuffs on the suspect. I think we're going to get a lot of videotape of civilians acting badly. Uh, I think it's going to show that 99% of our law enforcement officers are professionals doing a very, very difficult job. And so will we go to body cameras? We most assuredly will because that is the wave and people have asked for that. Again, of what uh, probative value it may be later, I'm, I'm not sure, but we're certainly going to get them. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. Rebuttal, Mr. Johnson. Please, uh, just to be clear, Mr. Morgan said for probationary employees, that's rookie police officers. Uh, that's a very small number of people that work at the Escambia County Sheriff's Office. As, as it is feasible and they can be afforded, every man or woman that's answering calls for service in Escambia County should eventually be wearing body cameras, not just probary, probationary officers. Rebuttal, Mr. Morgan. Well, number one, I, again, I said we'll be moving into that. We eventually will outfit everyone with those. I also, I guess this is the appropriate juncture to, uh, you know, educate my opponents on the trust fund. The trust fund are non-recurring funds, meaning that this year you might have $100,000 and next year you might have no dollars. And so that's why you never commit to a long-range plan using trust fund dollars. They are non-recurring. You do not know what that figure will be each and every year, and that's why you don't obligate those funds. All right, thank you. Uh, one more, uh, I think that's it. One rebuttal, one rebuttal. Mr. Baldwin, now this question to you, your opportunity to tell us if you support body cameras and how you would fund them. Yes, I do. And the way I would fund it is not only with the LETF funds, but you can also uh, apply for matching grants, federal grants that can supplement some of the uh, cost of the body cams. So coupled with the LETF funds, County Commissioner funding and grants, uh, we should be able to get the job done and outfit every officer that responds to calls uh, for service. All right, thank you candidates. And now it is time for our closing statements and you will each get 45 seconds. We will continue down the line and I think the first to get an opportunity will be Mr. McNesby, 45 seconds, your closing statement. Thank you. First of all, it's an honor to serve as the Sheriff of Escambia County Sheriff's Office or any county in the state of Florida. Being a sheriff is not about being a celebrity. Being a sheriff is about serving the people. It's not about me. It's about the people that live in this county. The Constitution of Florida says it is the sheriff's job to protect the community, to give them a feeling of, of security. <clears throat> I don't think that's happening today. You know, if you're gonna hire a doctor, you want one with experience. I have 43 years of experience. I've handled over 600 million of your dollars. I've, I've supervised 100 and 1,150 employees. I think that's very important. Our sheriff is not certified and never has been. Thank you, Mr. McNesby. Mr. Morgan, your closing statement. Thank you. Uh, I've been endorsed by the Escambia County Firefighters Union, the Pensacola Association of Realtors, the Police Benevolent Association, the National Rifle Association, and the Unified Sportsmen of Florida, and more importantly, the citizens of Escambia County. My opponent refers to being certified and experienced. You're right. I don't have any experience in falsifying police reports or being indicted by a grand jury. However, I do have experience with leadership. 
Leadership is, again, keeping our community going in the right direction. Our crime is down in Escambia County. We should be up and happy about our community. I can tell you that the men and women that serve with me at the Escambia County Sheriff's Office know that we are on the right path and on the right track. And I would tell you, greater things lie ahead. Otherwise, they would not have invested $600 million uh, with the Navy Credit Union and bring $10,000 to a community that's in decline. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. Mr. McNesby, a rebuttal. Well, thank you very much. First off, the sheriff's very well aware of the fact that uh, there is an outcome to every charge. I gave him eight years ago the response to the questions that he just raised about the grand jury. It was gnaw prost. The report's right here. It says, I did not do that. Because of politicians like Mr. Morgan, I got caught in that trap as a very young officer. Uh, it, there's no question about what happened, but it's not true. Mr. Morgan. Well, means a prosecution is set aside. It is not a declaration of innocence. All right, thank you. And we will continue on now with our closing statements. Mr. Baldwin, this is your opportunity, 45 seconds. Yes, Doug Baldwin, 35 years experience here in the city of Pensacola in Escambia County as a law enforcement officer. Our community and our country is in some challenging times. You don't have to look far to understand the challenges that face us as a community. Um, this is not about Doug Baldwin, Sheriff Morgan, or any other candidates here on this panel. This is about safe neighborhoods, addressing the drug issues, and who's best able to be able to do that for Escambia County. I have the ability, I have the tactical and strategic knowledge to get it done, and we will get it done as your sheriff. Thank you. All right, finally, Mr. Johnson, you get the last word, 45 seconds. Thank you very much. My name's John Johnson, and I am a candidate for sheriff. Uh, I worked at the sheriff's office for nine years, from 1982 to 1991. I was recruited to be a special agent with the Drug Enforcement Administration, where I served my country for 22 years. I understand the relationship between drugs and crime, and I'm in a unique position in my life that I'm able to be a uh, of public service to the people of Escambia County. As you know by now, I'm not a politician. I have no desire to be a politician. I'm a public servant. And that's all I'm asking for is the opportunity to be your public servant. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, and thanks to our candidates for Sheriff of Escambia County. We are taking a short break now. When we come back, we will meet the candidates for Escambia County Tax Collector. There is nothing more important to our democratic process than having an informed electorate voting on election day. Good evening, I am Ed Metis, president of Pensacola State College, thanking you for tuning into this rally, a joint presentation of the League of Women Voters, WSRE-TV and Pensacola State College. Rally allows you the opportunity to watch and listen as this election year's slate of candidates answer the tough questions concerning the needs of our community. WSRE, a service of Pensacola State College, is proud to bring this program to you as a public service. And as always, we invite your comments and suggestions about how we can further fulfill our community obligations. Let's all remember the importance of participating in the governance process by voting in the upcoming election. Welcome back to Rally 2016, where we are hearing from the candidates in the primary races for Escambia County tonight. We turn now to the race for Escambia County Tax Collector. There are two candidates in this race. Both are Republican. Time now to meet them in alphabetical order. The first candidate is Mr. Buckley. Welcome. And seated next to him, well, close to him anyway, is Mr. <laughs> Scott Lunsford. Welcome, candidates. Thank you. All right, it's time now to begin the question and answer session, and we will begin our first question with you, Mr. Lee. Number one, please assess the performance of the Escambia County Tax Collector's Office. Where is the office performing well? Where are opportunities for improvement? Well, I'll bring my experience from Jack Lee Buick, which is customer service. And that's what we have to do with any government building. People hate to walk into a government building. I walked into one of the government buildings the tax collectors had. Um, I had to wait an hour, uh, didn't like that. 
uh, and people shouldn't have to do that. I'll also, people don't realize that the tax collector also ha handles concealed weapon applications. When I told friends of mine that I was endorsed by the NRA, they said, what does the NRA have to do with tax collector? Well, we do the applications. The, what I want to do is the first 90 days, I'll meet with every employee. They're right there on the front line. What is your suggestion to make this more efficient and more customer friendly? And then we'll move from there. Thank you, Molly. All right, thank you, Mr. Lee. All right, Mr. Lunsford County, oops, sorry, same question. Please assess the performance of the Escambia County Tax Collector's Office, where the office is performing well, where you see room for improvement. I'm very proud of the opportunities we've had at the Tax Collector's Office. We've developed programs to help our homeless veterans, the homeless committees, and we've reached out into community to bring good service. Most of the time, our wait is less than an hour. Most customers come in, they spend 10 to 15 minutes waiting their line. We have a new QLA system where you can check in online and do your waiting from home or while you're doing errands and you arrive at our office and just enough time to get at the counter and you'll get your service and you'll be gone. Very proud of what we're doing and we've got a lot of improvements to come. Uh, customer service is always priority and that certainly will be my uh, priority as your tax collector. All right, thank you Mr. Lunsford. And this next question we start with you. County tax collectors beat back a proposal in 2015 that would have resulted in driver's licenses being issued statewide from a central provider. Should driver's licenses continue to be issued at the local tax collector's offices? If so, please explain why or why not. Absolutely, we should issue them locally. A lot of folks in the community, they lose their driving license to a hurricane. They need to get back on the beach. They need to get back on the beach quickly. They've lost their license. They need to fly tomorrow morning to Orlando to do business. So yes, we should issue the license in the office. It's a customer service issue, it's a security issue. You don't have to worry about that coming through the mail, getting lost, someone that shouldn't have your personal information, picking it out of your mailbox and being able to use it. So I support the fact that we print them in-house and until technology gets to the point we can move to the digital driving license, which I think we'll see in the next two or three years, uh, printing them in-house is the way to go. All right, thank you, Mr. Lunsford. Mr. Lee, same question to you. Would you like for me to repeat it? I like the way it's done now. Okay. Uh, and the reason being, let's say that uh, if you live in Escambia County, you can go to Santa Rosa County to get your license. And the same thing for Santa Rosa into Escambia. And so we, we, we can work back and forth, but I like, like Scott said, keep it here in our county. All right, thank you so much. And we'll begin our next question with you. The tax collector's office has a wide variety of duties to carry out. What training would you recommend for staff to perform these duties effectively? Well. When I got to the Island Authority ten and a half years ago, I had to meet with all the employees and find exactly what their duties were, and I do the same thing with the tax collector's office. Go in there, meet with them individually, ask them what they do, is there a way that you can do it more efficiently, more customer friendly, and we'll move forward that way. I don't mind making changes, and I'll work with the co-workers, and I don't call them employees or staff, they're co-workers, we're going to make this thing work. All right, thank you, Mr. Lee. Mr. Lunsford? The tax collector's office has a very robust training program for new employees. We take them through a training program for about 11 weeks. They learn how to read the paperwork. They learn how to process the paperwork, how to interact with our customers. We teach them fraudulent document recognition so that forged documents do not get through our system. We teach them how to identify uh, stolen vehicles and vehicles with auto altered VINs, example. So our program is, rebut is very robust, but we're I would make an improvement as your tax collector is it would be an ongoing system. I would rather see us bringing them back in on a more regular basis, hitting the key points, uh, focusing on customer service training and things like that to make sure that they're armed to help the customers today. All right, thank you, Mr. Lunsford. And we begin our next question with you. What improvements related to cybersecurity would you recommend for the tax collector's office? Cybersecurity is always important. We have a lot of positions. Uh, programs in place to protect your data. A lot of it's encrypted. Uh, for an example, we have a system that we can see everybody's information. I'm the only one in the county that can see certain points in that information because I take the um, protection of your information very seriously. So if someone wants to get into that database further than I allow them, they have to come to me and explain why. We have to keep moving forward in digital security. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, digital driving licenses are coming to your smartphone. You'll be able to use your phone in the next few years to show your driving license and take care of a lot of transactions electronically. And we have to keep wrapping security to keep that stuff protected. All right, thank you, Mr. Lunsford. Mr. Lee? 
with everybody getting hacked nowadays, I don't care if it's a tax collector or the federal government, you need to have a firm that comes in there. We cannot do it as far as with in-house computer IT people. We need to have a firm to come in there to make sure we cannot be hacked, that nobody can get to our information. And you've seen all these corporations across America that are getting hacked. So I would go out and consult with a company, maybe like AppRiver or something like that, that can come in and take a look at our programs to make sure our information that we have at the tax collector's office that nobody can come in and steal. All right, and uh, question number five, we begin. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I missed your rebuttal, Mr. Mr. Lunsford. Please go ahead, you have 30 seconds. Yes, ma'am. I uh, just want to point out quickly that the information systems that we use do have those IT professionals. These systems are owned by the Department of Highway Safety, by the Department of Agriculture. All those systems have very robust systems. They have teams of network engineers that are protecting it. And we have the same thing in the county system where we track your uh, property taxes and those things, which as you know, most of your uh, public record requests come from open records and property taxes is open. So the risk factor for the most information we have is uh, placed on the shoulders of the state departments who actually have that information in their data banks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lunsford. All right, question number five now. We begin with you, Mr. Lee. What changes, if any, would you recommend to the tax collector's office budget? Please explain. Well, the reason I got into the tax collector's, tax collector's race, I look at two things. Their budget, 7.3 million, the budget I did at the Island Authority between eight and nine million. So I figured I could figure that out. But both of them are based on fees. There's a fee budget for the tax collector. Every time you get a process through there, they add a little fee. The same thing on the beach, whether it's residential lease fees or commercial lease fees. And that's why I know that I can do the job with the same number of employees, a larger budget that I formulated, okay? So I'm looking forward to August 30th from the Republican primary. As a lifelong Republican, I want your vote. Thank you. All right, Mr. Lee, thank you so much. Mr. Lunsford? Please repeat the question. Absolutely. What changes, if any, would you recommend to the tax collector's office budget? And please explain. The budget's in pretty good shape. We have about a $7.5 million budget. There are some things that we will uh, streamline, some uh, basic flip philosophical differences on how we spend the money. Uh, the difference in the fee collection is the magnitude at your tax collector's office. Our cash flow is about $600 million a year. We handle about 800 to $900,000 or 900,000 transactions a year, about 80,000 driving license transactions. So to compare the beach to the tax collector's office is apples and oranges. Our staff's in good shape. We've got about the right number of people. There are some tweakings that we need to do, but I'm pretty happy with where we are now. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Oh, we do have a rebuttal. Yes, Mr. Yes. Lee. Uh, I'm the only one in the race that has ever formulated a budget millions of dollars, and that's between eight and nine million dollars. Uh, like Scott mentioned, theirs is about 7.3, so I know how to formulate a budget. Thank you. Excellent. And this will be our last question for the candidates. We begin with you, Mr. Lunsford. As your duties are strictly administrative, should the tax collector's office be a nonpartisan office, and why? Well, that's a question for the voters. Uh, I think the voters need to decide that, and I'm thinking that's where it needs to be left is with the voters. Thank you. All right, thank you. Mr. Lee, would you like for me to repeat the question? No, I understand it completely. Uh, when I was 21 years old, I went down to Palafox Street and registered as a Republican. There were about 8% of us in the whole county. I believe in a two-party system. Uh, if the state legislature or the voters decide differently, then I'll live with it. But I think what's made this country great is our two-party system. But thank you. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, candidates. It is now time for your closing statements. You'll each have 45 seconds. Moving down the line, we begin now with Mr. Lee. You'll have 45 seconds. Thank you, Molly. The, uh, I want to thank the League Women Voters and WSRE. Like I said, the Republican primary is August 30th. I'm a lifelong Republican. I'd like to be your tax collector. Uh, I've been endorsed by the National Rifle Association. I've been endorsed uh, by the Unified Sportsmen of Florida. Just yesterday, I found out that a pro-life PAC in Florida has endorsed me. And also, I've been recommended by the uh, Pensacola Association of Realtors, a diverse group that all know that I can manage this position and do a great job as tax collector in Escambia County. Elections August 30th. Thank you very much and I hope you vote for me and God bless you. All right, thank you, Mr. Lee. Mr. Lunsford, it's your turn now. You have 45 seconds for closing remarks. Your choice is not about politics. It's about choosing the person with the correct knowledge and experience for this job. For nearly 30 years, I've worked for the Division of Motor Vehicles, recently 15 years with the tax collector's office. I formulated budgets at the DMV, had to roll back budgets 10% year after year. We had to learn how to do more with less. I'm very familiar with that. 
I'm honored to have the endorsement of your current tax collector, Janet Holly, and I'd appreciate it if you'd think of me and vote for me on August the 30th. If, to learn more, go to scottlunsford2016.com, and you can check out our Facebook page. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Lunsford. Thank you to both of our candidates for Escambia County Tax Collector. Up next, we'll hear from those running for Escambia School Board District 1. We'll be right back after this short break. Thank you for watching Rally 2016 on WSRE TV. I'm Mary Blackwell, President of the League of Women Voters of Okaloosa County. For nearly 30 years, the Okaloosa and Pensacola Bay Area Leagues have provided questions for events like tonight's forum as a service to our local communities. The success of our democracy depends on active participation by informed citizens, which begins with voting. The League of Women Voters is nonpartisan, which means we do not support or oppose parties or candidates. This rally is one way for us to make accurate and nonpartisan information available to voters. You can also contact us for explanations of amendments, merit retention of judges, or other ballot issues. We invite women and men to attend our public events or join us as members of League. For more information, please see our website and you can contact us there too. Please remember to be an informed voter this year. There are three ways to cast a ballot in Okaloosa County, by mail, early voting, or at your precinct on election day. To vote by mail, contact the Okaloosa County Supervisor of Elections office. You can write, phone, fax, email, log on to their website, or visit the supervisor's office locations in Crestview and Fort Walton Beach. Ballots must reach the Supervisor of Elections offices by 7 p.m. on election day. Early voting takes place from Saturday, August 20th through Saturday, August 27th at the five locations listed on screen. Hours for early voting are 10 a.m. until 6 p.m. each day. On the day of the primary election, Tuesday, August 30th, voting takes place at your polling location from 7 a.m. until 7 p.m. You must vote in the precinct in which you live and are registered. Be sure to bring your photo and signature ID with you. Welcome back to Rally 2016. I'm Sandra Averhart with WUWF Public Media. We are turning our attention now to the race for Escambia County School Board District 1. There are two candidates in this race. This is a nonpartisan race and the top vote getter who receives or well, will receive 50% plus one of the vote and will be declared the winner in the primary election. Now time to meet the candidates in alphabetical order. The first candidate tonight is Mr. Kevin Adams and seated next to him, Willie Kirkland Jr. Mr. Willie Kirkland Jr. Welcome gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's get started with the questions. And again, these were prepared by the League of Women Voters of the Pensacola Bay Area. We are beginning in alphabetical order with Mr. Adams. And our first question to you is, please comment on the current Florida law that allows corporations to ship their taxes to fund vouchers for religious and private schools rather than paying those taxes to the state. I, I am in support of that law to provide uh, credits to corporations. Uh, those vouchers that the corporations provide, they, they help the uh, uh, kids in high poverty areas. So as long as the ceiling caps are set the right way, the funding limits, then I think it's a good, good law. Thank you. Mr. Kirkland, that question to you again. What are your comments on the current Florida law that allows corporations to ship their taxes to fund vouchers for religious and private schools rather than paying those taxes to the state? I feel like those corporations should have a choice and that should be the choice of that corporation and we should encourage them to use it the right way um, but that should be their choice. Yes. Okay all right uh, our next question will go to you first Mr. Kirkland as the school district shifts to providing a computer for every student what should the district do in terms of teacher training and technical infrastructure? 
um, they should make sure um, that the kids, the parents, the teachers are all on the same page. Um, they should make sure that the parents have the time and the education to know how to work these um, items properly. That way they can make sure their kids work them properly. Okay, thank you. Mr. Adams? Uh, I'm, I'm just uh, really pleased that the superintendent and the board is providing these Chrome notebook computers for uh, third graders up. It's great. The technology is just ever increasing. Uh, the district's already increased bandwidth. They, they improved the network infrastructure. So uh, yes, and the teachers are being trained right along with them. So I think we're on the right track and we'll just keep monitoring it and see if they, we need to make any more improvements. All right, thank right. you. Mr. Adams, this question to you first. Given the media focus on pre-K pre programs and assessment of kindergarten readiness, what do you see as one major factor for improving kindergarten readiness? Well, um, the, 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 one of the focuses for nonprofits should be the zero to four age group. Uh, we count on those nonprofits for that pre-K program and down to uh, make sure these kids are getting the correct nutrition and, um, and get a jump start. Uh, we're going to have to look at more at the third grade level where there's a little bit of fade out. So to try to help those kids, once they get that jump start, to maintain that jump start. So uh, that's the one that improvement. Start a little earlier with them and then carry it on. All right, thank All you. Right. Mr. Kirkland, what do you see as one major factor for improving kindergarten readiness? One major factor of improving kindergarten read readiness is communication. That's one of the number one factors that will improve it. Um, we should encourage all parents to um, get our kids prepared for kindergarten. And um, that way everybody can be on the same ballpark once they reach first grade. All right, thank you. Mr. Kirkland, you get this question first. What are your ideas related to student discipline which would not require out of school suspensions or expulsions? We should utilize in school suspension, um, after school suspension even more. Um, suspension and expulsion should be our last um, choice. Um, we should have many other options, that's the word options. Suspension and expulsion should be our last option at all times. All right, Mr. Adams. Hi. Yeah, I, I, I really believe on this situation here, we gotta make sure that, that the teachers are allowed to teach and that the kids are allowed to learn. Then those with chronic behavioral problems, they need to go in another stream with a behavioral management program. Hopefully outside the uh, after school or on the weekends or whatever applies that. So the biggest emphasis that I've heard from District 1 voters is discipline in the, in the classroom. So if we can control that classroom, that improves the educational environment. All right, thank you, Mr. Adams. And you get the next question first. What proposal would you offer to improve Escambia County Schools? Um, I think we had to just carry on with what we're doing now with the, how the Chromebooks that came out, the new computers keep going along with the technology. We also need to look at the vocational areas and make sure we're strong there because not everybody's going to college. So if you have a young man that may be a good welder, a good plumber, whatever, we need to look at those blue collar vocational jobs too, right along with the high technology jobs. So my emphasis will be right on that area, plus making sure that we got the discipline in that classroom and improve that, that learning atmosphere in the classroom. All right, thank All right. you. Mr. Kirkland, what proposal do you offer for improving Escambia County Schools? We cannot keep doing what we're doing. Escambia County Schools are failing. Um, we have to do something different. We have to change the way we vote. We have to hold people accountable, the school board, the superintendents, the parents. We have to stop pointing the finger at each other and we have to do our job as parents. We have to do our job as superintendent. We have to do our job as school board leaders. And that's what I think is the major way that could improve. All right, thank you. Rebuttal from... Yeah, I, would, I just want to make sure that everybody knows we've got a lot of outstanding students, a lot of outstanding teachers, a lot of outstanding administrators. I've worked with them, you know, on my time on the Half Cent Sales Tax Committee, Chairman's Exact Committee, President of Quarterback Club at United High School. So there's a lot of people every day, so there's a lot of success stories, and I hope that if I get elected, maybe we'll have a virtual Hall of Fame or something like that because a, a lot of the good stuff is not being noticed and we're, we're, we're concentrating on a small percentage of what's going wrong. 
Rebuttal, Mr. Kirkland. I would like to say that comment I made, it wasn't towards the um, active superintendent. It wasn't towards any of the active um, school board members. Um, we in this election stage and we'll have new people on the board and all of those people, we need to make sure we vote and those people are held accountable. All right, thank you and thank you candidates. We now will continue with our closing statements. You will each get 45 seconds and we will move this first opportunity for closing statement to Mr. Kirkland, 45 seconds. I wanna thank you for your time. Um, Scamia County School Board District 1. Um, I've talked to many people in the neighborhoods. I've gone door to door and they feel like it's time for change. If you're going to have change, you have to change the way you vote. You have to do something different. Um, I'm that person. I'm, will I'm willing to be a voice for the community. I'm willing to listen to the community and I'm willing to make decisions with my community. Um, the decisions that are best for our kids in the school system. I currently have kids in the school system and it would be my job to be accountable and to do the best and do the right thing that's for our, the right thing for our kids at all times. You, um, my website is www.votewilliekirklandjr.com. Please look me up. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Adams. And I want to thank the League of Women Voters and WSRE TV for putting this on. Uh, I, I will start out right tell you I've got an endorsement of Superintendent Malcolm Thomas uh, for school board. Uh, the current school board member, Jeff Bergosh, who's at District 1, is endorsing my candidacy. I think with the growth of District 1 right now, you need somebody in there that's already got experience. We're going to be putting new schools in. We're going to be redistricting. I've spent eight, almost ten years on the uh, ZAZAC committee. Uh, with these new schools going in, two on the north, in the Buell area, one down in the south. You, I think the voters need to look at the experience of both candidates and decide which one's going to be handled this growth in District 1. And I thank everybody. All right, thank you, and thank you, gentlemen. And we are now headed into the final race of the night. When we come back from a short break, we'll meet the candidates for Scambia County Commissioner, District 5. Stay with us. Thanks for watching this year's rally event on WSRE TV. I am Haley Richards. Ellen Rossin and I serve as co-presidents of the League of Women Voters of the Pensacola Bay Area. For nearly 30 years, the leagues here and in Okaloosa County have provided questions for events like tonight's forum as a service to our local communities. Our democracy is based on active participation by informed citizens, and voting is an important way to participate. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization, which means we don't support or oppose parties or candidates. We work to increase understanding of major public policy issues and encourage informed and active participation in government. This rally is one way for us to make accurate and nonpartisan information available to voters. You can also contact us for explanations of amendments and other ballot issues. We invite women and men to attend our public events or join us as members of the League. For more information, visit lwvpba.org or lwvokaloosa.org. And please remember to be an informed voter this year. There are three ways to cast a ballot in Santa Rosa County, by mail, early voting, or at your precinct on election day. To vote by mail, contact the Santa Rosa County Supervisor of Elections Office by phone, mail, fax, or email. Ballots must reach the Supervisor of Elections Office by 7 p.m. on Election Day. Early voting takes place from Monday, August 15th through Saturday, August 27th in Milton, Pace, and at two locations in the Greater Gulf Breeze area. Early voting hours each day are 8.30 a.m. until 4.30 p.m. On the day of the primary election, Tuesday, August 30th, voting takes place from 7 a.m. until 7 p.m. You must vote in the precinct in which you live and are registered. Be sure to bring photo and signature ID with you.
Welcome back to Rally 2016. We're moving on now to the race for Escambia County Commission District 5. This is a universal race. It's open to all voters in the district and it will be decided in the August 30th primary. There are two candidates in this race. Both are Republican and we intended to introduce them in alphabetical order, meaning that we would introduce uh, candidate Stephen Berry first. However, Mr. Berry, who is the incumbent, is currently at an Escambia County Commission meeting and we had made adjustments to have this race at the end of this segment, at the end of this rally tonight, but unfortunately that commission meeting is still continuing and if he does come, then we will certainly make room for him at the podium, at the desk to answer some questions. But in the meantime, we will present those questions now to our second candidate, Danny Smiley, who does join us here at the WSRE studios and welcome Mr. Smiley. You are one of the two candidates for Escambia County Commissioner and we will begin our first question with you. With unemployment exceptionally high in the Century area, what plan can you offer for using BP settlement funds to provide job training in District 5? <clears throat> well, uh, we need to have the community center. Uh, we need to have some training in there, uh, some kind of Votech training. A lot of people up there don't have a chance to, to learn. They can't get down here. So if we get some training up there to teach them Votech skills, welding, carpentry, uh, this is going to help a long ways. There, there's a lot of building going on uh, in the future. There's some companies coming up there. So we need to make sure if it's Votech, if it's computer training, we can get it to them. So they'll be ready and, you know, in the, in the town ready to do the job there. And they'll be the first ones to get a chance to have a job. That's the only way we can build Century up. Okay. All right, thank you so much. And here is our second question. Given the transportation challenges in northern Escambia, what can you propose to address these issues? Well, <clears throat> we have to, the evacuation route on the traffic is 29 to, to get out of here for hurricane comes. There's a couple places already that flood. Uh, there at Atmore Highway floods and just north of Cedar Tree in cantonment floods. So we're going to have to address that. It's been bad for several years. If a hurricane comes, we can't even get out of here. So I know there was talking about a bypass to put in, but it still comes right back into Highway 29 there at Barron Park Road. So we're going to have to put bridges in. We've got to bypass it. We have to open up the creeks so that the water can flow away because the evacuation route is stopped. Thank you. All right, thank you. And question number three. In 2015, five deaths were reported at the Escambia County Jail, far exceeding the comparable statistics nationwide. What steps should be taken to address this issue? Well, when the new jail's built, uh, we've got to make sure we put top of the line security in it as far as video cameras. Because uh, uh, this way you'll be able to see what's going on. It'll protect the officers. It protects the inmates. Uh, it stops lawsuits, it stops waste of tax dollars. That's got to be a priority when the jail is built to make sure that the technology is put in there uh, so you can monitor each cell, each pod. I've been a correction officer before. It, it's a dangerous job, but it will save because nobody wants their kid to go there and get hurt. Uh, and we sure don't want an officer hurt. So the video is the best way to go for surveillance and it will save the officers. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Question number four. What is your top priority for improving the infrastructure in the county, such as roads, bridges, and drainage? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> We've got to address the traffic on Nine Mile Road. The state's doing some of that. Uh, 29, like I said earlier, is a, is a issue. We have to fix 29 where it don't flood. We have no way to escape a storm. Uh, a lot of the bridges in the north end of District 5, they're 80, 90 years old. Uh, it's constant wrecks, the bridges, uh, the pilings are rotting, so we have to get in there and do something. It's been let go for many years, but as county commissioner, I'm going to make sure we take care of it, and I'm going to make sure we fix Highway 29 because we have to be able to evacuate Escambia County. It's a whole county issue. It's not District 5. We have to be able to leave here in the storm, and it's been like this for many years. And along those lines, speaking of storm, storm water runoff continues to be a critical issue throughout Escambia County. From your perspective, how should this problem be addressed? 
one of the runoff, uh, if we open the creeks up and the flooding, uh, but we have to make sure we have a lot of filtration fences put in, silt fences to stop the silt from running out. Uh, a lot of the timber companies are cutting temper, timber, which makes the water run faster, sedimentation runs, and eventually it gets to our creeks, and we have to protect them. That's all we have here. Uh, they're beautiful, they're crystal clear. People come from all over the world to come to Escambia County. Perdita River is, is pristine, and we have to keep it that way. So I really want to work on with making sure the boundaries are put back where you can't cut as close, and make sure any silt does not run. We can stop it. There's uh, several, okay, I better stop. You're doing fine. That uh, first bell is your five second warning that your 45 seconds is uh, close to being up. Okay. So 45 seconds for, for each answer. And we'll move on to question number six. What role should the county commission play in addressing health care needs in District 5? <clears throat> well, we, we have a lot of people. Uh, I've noticed the homeless is real bad here. Uh, we're going to have to put some more money into shelters being built. Uh, natural just shelters, not just they stay there that night. But what I want to do is put some training in them. Don't, don't just come there and stay. If you stay there that night, you're going to go through some kind of a training to where you can learn some skills where they can get a job. It, it, it can't even like the jail. We can't just have them coming in and out over and over and over. And the, the homeless have to have help. They're down on their luck. Most of them has no skills. And we have to have some training at the community centers or, you know, at a county facility to where they can get help. All right, Mr. Smiley. And our last question for you tonight. What action do you think should be taken to decrease poverty and increase the quality of life in District 5? <clears throat> well, we've got to get some jobs up there. We have a, a few things in District 5, a few local stores. Uh, the, the plant up in Canton, it's pretty big. Most people work there, but everybody can't work at the plant. So we need to increase uh, training. Uh, and one thing at the community centers in District 5, uh, they're just there now for gatherings and community gatherings, but they need to be training there. That's where I want to put some Votech training so when people go there, young kids, 13, 14, 15, and start learning some skills. Uh, we, we're short welders, we're short framers, carpenters concrete people and they can be taught skills there so when they do get out of school they're ready to go to work and this will help us Gamby County especially District 5. All right thank you Mr. Smiley. It is time now for closing statements and you will have 45 seconds to make your closing remarks. You may begin. Hello my name is Danny Smiley and I'm running for County Commissioner District 5. I started with the county in 1984. I have over 30 years experience. I'm going to be a full-time commissioner, not a part-time. That's what it takes to be a full-time. District 5 is the biggest district in the county, so you have to be a full-time to be there. I'm going to put two offices in District 5, one in Cantonment and one in the north end of the county. I'm going to fight for the funds to get our roads fixed and our bridges fixed, and we're going to address the flooding in District 5. And I ask you to vote for Danny Smiley, County Commissioner, District 5, and God bless America. Thank you. Mr. Smiley, thank you so much for answering our questions tonight on Rally 2016. And again, a reminder that the second candidate on that ballot is Mr. Stephen Berry. He is the incumbent. He is currently attending at a Scambia County Commission meeting that has gone long, if you will. And we did intend to have him on tonight, and we hope to hear from him at some point. But in the meantime, be sure to tune in online to WSRE, where we will have the past three nights of Rally 2016 for you to view in the coming days. Well, in the meantime, that is a wrap for Rally 2016, and we have certainly heard from a number of candidates all across Northwest Florida, as well as state and national races, and hope you've gotten a chance to get to know them and some of the issues that will be on the ballot in the coming days. Yes, and of course, again, you will find all three nights of Rally 2016 online at WSRE.org, and we encourage you to share that information with those who were unable to watch our programs live. And our thanks to the League of Women Voters and to Pensacola State College for their efforts in supporting this program. Be sure to tune in for the Rally 2016 General Election Program on October 25th and 26th. Be safe and be sure to vote in the August 30th primary. Thanks for joining us. Good night.